This is the newsroom for today, Thursday, April 8, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, SCAR TV, NTN, and Tarsi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, the Army is deployed to help with the COVID-19 vaccination drive as two more deaths put Guyana's death toll at 252. They would be in every region helping out our team. The COVID-19 task force issues an advisory for observing Ramadan. A state-of-the-art secondary school constructed at a cost of $1 billion is finally complete. A woman is remanded to prison for the murder of her husband. We'll tell you how a young entrepreneur turned her passion for making lemonade into profit. And in sport, Guyana stands realistic chance of progressing to the second round of FIBA World Cup qualifiers and cricket in Burbis and Georgetown suspended over COVID-19 fears. With the news, I'm Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for joining us. We started by telling you that some 400 ranks of the Ghana Defence Force have been deployed to assist with the countrywide COVID-19 vaccination campaign. According to the Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, ranks trained in the medical field will assist with the actual vaccination, while others will assist with documentation and the COVID-19 vaccine education program. The minister explained that with the added personnel, the vaccination drive will be accelerated. They would be in every region helping out our teams. Uh, their roles would, would vary. Those that are from the medical corps uh, would be able to help us with vaccination. Those who are, uh, have other skill set would probably help us with uh, explaining to the patients um, or the persons who are coming for vaccines uh, the, the difference between vaccines what we are looking for, things like side effects and so forth. I think that's um, very important. So they'll help us with this education program and also they would assist us with uh, documenting uh, the information that we need to collect. So that's the role that they would play and um, we are happy that the GDF has allowed us to get access to these personnel because they would certainly enhance uh, the accelerated rollout that we have. Meanwhile, the ministry on Thursday reported two more COVID-19 deaths, taking the number to 252 since the first death was recorded just over a year ago in Guyana. The latest fatalities are a 59-year-old man from Region 6 and a 73-year-old male from Region 7. It means 18 persons have died in the past eight days. Guyana is now facing a third, more deadlier wave of the dreaded coronavirus, which is rapidly spreading across the country and attacking the younger population. According to advisor to the Ministry of Health, Dr. Leslie Ramsamy, the infection is now more transmissible and there has been a rapid increase in infections recorded in regions 3, 4 and 6. What is even more worrisome is that this new wave is making the younger population sicker and Dr. Ramsamy explained that more young people are showing symptoms of the virus and are being hospitalized. Now, there is no special arrangement in place for all teachers to be vaccinated as a group, but the Minister of Education, Priya Manikchand, said the arrangements are in place for that to happen once vaccines become available. Teachers 40 years and older can get vaccinated with the rest of the population, but Minister Manikchand told the newsroom that vaccinating all teachers as a block, regardless of age, is not possible at this time because of the limited number of vaccines available. She said the opening of schools for all grade levels will depend on the vaccination drive and when the Ministry of Health determines that it is best to do so. At this time, no date has been set for the full reopening of schools with only students from forms 4 to 6 back in the classroom at this time. Everyone has also said that teachers will be on the front line, um, one of the front line workers, but we need the relevant number of vaccines. So right now, as we speak, teachers can get vaccinated if they're 40 years and over. But I am aware that we are working to get vaccines into the country where we would be able to vaccinate all teachers, whether 40 years or over or under, um, so that we could treat teachers as um, a special category so that we could try to reopen schools as early as possible. So that would be how we are treating with the teachers. We have already, we are ready. Um, logistically, we have issued to all teachers letters that would be able to identify them, assuming an announcement is made tomorrow that we're going to treat teachers as a special category regardless of their age. A 20-year-old teacher walking into a vaccination center will have a letter issued by the government of Guyana, either through their he head teacher or department, that says I'm a teacher with this ID number and here's my ID card. And so the teacher ought to have no trouble. So we are ready logistically. We're waiting on vaccines to the 
right number of vaccines to get into the country to allow us to do that. Let me just be very clear. We would like to see schools reopen tomorrow as early as possible. We are very sure, particularly after this closure, how very valuable face-to-face -face instruction and learning is. And we also know how important it is for students to be supervised as well as to socialize. So we know there are great benefits to going back to school. We also know that based on the reports about this virus, that people can carry it. So students and teachers could contract this virus and take it back home to their family members who might be a little bit more vulnerable to it. We see a new surge in Guyana. And that new surge is attacking younger people um, without known comorbidities and without any health problems, so much so that we're seeing people dying that probably should not. If we were to reopen schools for all grade levels, we would be letting 170,000 children back on the roads, back into buses, back into classrooms with about 12,000 teachers. So you're talking about a large number of people there that will most likely contribute to community spread. And even if the children themselves do not get severely sick, and we pray God that no child does, then we, can also, we could see them transferring and, and transmitting this virus. And if the, you know, the new variants have been reported to be virus that are more easily transmissible, we don't know what is here and what isn't here. So the Ministry of Health is being cautious, and I don't think overly cautious. I mean, we see the numbers rising. We see the numbers of deaths rising. And so we want to make sure we do the right thing, the safe thing. And so this is one time when the reopening of schools will not be up to the Ministry of Education. It is up to the Ministry of Health and what they see as the trajectory of this disease and this virus and to, for them to tell us whether it's safe or not to go back to school. When the newsroom returns, COVID-19 restrictions for observance of Ramadan and the first diaspora conference to be held next month. This is the newsroom. The Muslim holy month of Ramadan will be observed in Ghana from Tuesday, April 13, 2021. As a result of health and security concerns, the National COVID-19 Task Force has issued an advisory of restrictions to the traditional observances. On consultation with the Muslim leadership of Guyana, the guidelines were formulated. These guidelines are intended to allow for a limited participation of Ramadan activities while maintaining the religious obligations. 1. Mosques can be opened at the prescribed time for the five daily prayers. 2. Prayers and religious programs are allowed at 40% capacity of the mosques. Masjids are encouraged to utilize their outdoor spaces where available to accommodate their members with adequate social distancing. Persons entering the masjids must wear a mask, wash or sanitize at the entrance and observe social distancing of four feet apart during the prayer. Four, the masjids must have sanitizers and face masks available for use by all persons attending. Imams and the executives of the masjids are responsible for enforcing the COVID-19 measures on the premises. Five, persons attending the masjids as an additional precaution should walk with a prayer mat. Six, personal iftar arrangements are permissible while maintaining the mandatory spacing. However, feeding and congregational iftars are not permitted at the masjids. 7. Isha and Tarawi prayers should be concluded by 21 hours 30. 8. The following persons should not attend the masjids in Ramadan. Sick, elderly, incapacitated persons, pregnant women and children under 11 years. 9. Persons are encouraged to observe Ramadan and celebrate Eid al-Fitr within their home circles. 10. Charitable activities and Eid celebrations must not involve crowds. 11. To avoid overcrowding for the Juma and Eid al-Fitr prayers, multiple prayers can be conducted at the same venue after subsequent sanitization. The COVID-19 task force will be conducting COVID curb inspections nationwide to ensure compliance with these guidelines. Now, the state-of-the-art Westminster Secondary School is finally completed and is expected to be handed over to the government in the coming week. Education Minister Priya Manikchand on Thursday made a site visit to the inspector facility, expressing satisfaction with the works done. Here's more from Shakima Day. Equipped with a music and dance studio, multi-purpose hall, audio-visual libraries and a modern library among others, the Westminster Secondary School, according to the Education Minister Priya Manikchand, will be among the most resourced schools in Guyana once the doors open. It is the first secondary school in one of the country's largest housing scheme, La Parfit Harmony, West Bank, Demerara. 
constructed at a cost of one billion, the school is expected to be handed over to government in the coming week. A highly pleased Minister Manik Chan on Thursday paid a visit to the spanking new facility. This one, as you saw, is ready for us to uh, take over, for it to be handed over to us. And as you can see, it is a beautiful school. It is um, probably going to be one of our uh, most resourced schools, given the labs and so on that we've seen. And we want to make sure the children of Region 3 can benefit from it. The minister explained that once opened, the school will enable the ministry to close primary tops, which are primary schools that allow students to continue their secondary education there, as no secondary school is available for their use. This school is going to be able to house a thousand children, so it's going to be a grade A school. Grade A speaks grade speaks to quantity, thousand, and it's going to be a list B school. List speaks to the quality. We intend to move that up to a grade A over the next few years. We want to offer CAPE subjects here. It's going to be fully staffed with competent, trained graduate teachers um, and ancillary staff. And it's going to be uh, a school that we will use as a model to show once uh, there are resources and trained teachers, children from anywhere can do well. The school will also be equipped with a modern technical vocational education training departments for home economics, home management, and clothing and textile. Added to the aforementioned departments, there will be an information technology and a mathematics laboratory. The school will also house biology, chemistry, and physics labs. A unit of allied arts and a modern administration block will complete this structure. The Westminster School will also have classrooms that cater for students with disabilities. For the newsroom, I am Shakima Day. We tell you now that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation will run off a major virtual diaspora conference in May 22, 2021, the Foreign Secretary Robert Posad announced on Thursday. With hopes of attracting interested groups and individuals, both at home and across the diaspora, the conference will see the participation of President Irfan Ali as a featured guest. Posad said key agencies like the Ghana Revenue Authority and the Ghana Office for Investment, Go Invest, will participate. The Ministers of Foreign Affairs, Finance, Housing and Tourism, among others, are also likely to offer presentations and make themselves available for engagement prior to, during and after the conference. The Foreign Secretary said the conference is seen as one part of forging ahead with the government's plan of engaging and involving the diaspora to support its national development priorities. I want to make it absolutely clear that our emphasis in the diaspora is not to the disadvantage of persons who have lived here, who worked here, who have studied here, and who have perhaps made a sacrifice of staying on. Because um, sometimes I think people see it as a com competition. It is not. For us, it is how we can complement the progress that we're making, how we can, uh, as it were, to further support the government's uh, vision and the developmental drive, the president's own um, efforts to transform the country. So it is, it is utilizing that resource out there and to see what we can attract to support what we have here. So it is not taking away opportunities from persons here. So I want to make that absolutely clear. It is not giving preferential access or opportunities uh, to the disadvantage of persons who are here. So I want to have that completely, um, you know, to remove any concerns they may have, because sometimes I would see um, letters or receive emails or, or different forms of feedback in this regard. Meanwhile, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Transport and Harbors Department, Rosalinda Rasul, is the new head of the Diaspora and Remigration Unit within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. She will be supported in her duties of leading the government's diaspora engagement activities by the Foreign Service staff and former head of the Consular Section of Guyana's Embassy in Belgium, Leroy Adolphus. The unit was set up as part of enhancing the government's plans of engaging and involving the diaspora to support its national development priorities allowing for an enhanced, sustained and coordinated engagement with all Guyanese abroad. Now the search for 20-year-old Avinash Fanans ended tragically on Thursday when his decomposed body was found floating in the Arakaka River Northwest District in Region 1. Fanans of Mabruma Compound, Region 1, went missing on Monday, April 5. Police in a statement said his body was found sometime between 7 hours and 11 hours 45 by a party of policemen and Keith Alfonso, the man that Fanans worked for. Police said no marks of violence were seen on the body. The body was taken to the Port Kaituma 
Public Hospital. Fernandes was last seen on April 5 at around 21 hours at his camp in the Arakaka Bagdam at 13 mile, that 13 mile trail line and a missing persons report was issued for him. When the newsroom returns, a woman is remanded to prison for the murder of her husband and the government says the increase in the price for beef has to do with distribution problems and not a shortage. This is the newsroom. A woman was on Thursday remanded to prison for the murder of her reputed husband, 46-year-old Darren Harris of Efield Cummings Park, Sophia Georgetown. Eva Pearson, aged 27, appeared before Magistrate Alicia George at a Spandam Magistrate's Court and was not required to plead to the charge. She was remanded to prison until May 18, 2021. According to reports, Harris and Pearson once shared a relationship, but it ended about a week prior to the incident due to domestic issues. According to a female witness, she overheard an argument on the road and later saw Harris lying on the roadway with the woman not too far away from his body. The witness raised an alarm and the EMT ambulance service subsequently arrived and pronounced Harris dead. Police said the body bore three stab wounds, one to the left side chest and two to the left side upper back. Pearson was later arrested at her home where it was observed that she was bleeding profusely from a wound between her right index and her ring finger. She claimed that she and Harris were involved in a scuffle during which he dealt her a chop to her fingers. She further claimed that she relieved him of a knife and inflicted injuries on him before discarding the knife. The Minister of Agriculture, Zulfikar Mustafa, on Wednesday said there is no lack of beef in the country, though the COVID-19 pandemic and the inclement weather has resulted in difficulties in transporting the meat. The announcement was made during a discussion with stakeholders in the beef industry at the Minister's office. Sheena Henry reports. Minister of Agriculture, Zulfikar Mustafa, explained that because of complaints regarding a supposed shortage of beef in the country and a spike in prices, he requested that the Guyana Livestock Development Authority, GLDA, conduct a survey to be certain. Because if you go in the rural areas, in many major markets, in the rural areas, I don't think there is a shortage of beef. I don't think there is an increase of prices in the rural areas. So it seems that this issue is affecting some entity in Georgetown. GLDA, upon conducting an examination, found that the extreme weather and the COVID-19 pandemic were affecting the transportation of the meat from the suppliers to the markets. The agriculture minister, whilst stating that there is no shortage in beef, there is a problem with supply, but this will be resolved. But my main aim as the minister of agriculture and the government aim is to ensure that the cost of the meat is reachable, consumer must be afford to purchase it, and we don't have a shortage. So I hope that after today's meeting, we can work out some system in place, and we can also look at those entities that are affected, how we can help to boost those areas, get those entities to get the um, beef, to, uh, they could, um, get beef uh, at a reasonable cost so that they could sell it at a reasonable cost too to the consumer. Meanwhile, GLDA's Livestock Industry Development Specialist, Michael Welch, stressed the substantial influence livestock makes to Guyana's gross domestic product, GDP. He said Guyana's total domestic beef consumption stands at about 3 million kilograms and more than 90% of that amount is locally produced. GLDA has been quietly doing a number of things, a number of interventions, and we have found that the amount of meat we get per animal has been increasing because we talk in genetic improvement, among other things. Um, but a lot of our farmers are in a position where they only sell when things bad. So there's one thing we got to ensure that if they are in the beef business, you got to sell when the market demand it, not when things bad. So there's something we need to look at. Statistics have shown that almost 6 million pounds of beef were produced locally in 2020, with the current price ranging between $350 to $600 per pound. For the newsroom, I am Sheena Henry. The government has started preliminary works to establish a new road corridor between Bartica and Timeri in keeping with the campaign promise. On Wednesday, the Minister of Public Works, Juan Edgel, the former Prime Minister Samuel Hines, and a team of technical personnel inspected the proposed route for the road. The inspection of the route began with a short boat ride from Bartica to Foulmouth Dock on the Essequibo River, then along a logging trail to Macauri River, then to Sand Hills and to Mary. The Ghana Defence Force provided support during Wednesday's exercise. This year's budget provides $25.6 billion for the construction of roads and bridges through the Ministry of Public Works. The aim of this activity is to 
continue wrecking the Bartica to Timeri uh, road link. This is an idea that has been around for quite some time. It will involve a barge crossing from Bartica to possibly an area around Foulmouth. And then today we came along all the logging trail, much better than I expected. And we got to the uh, Macaura Creek, we made a crossing there, and then we came along uh, old uh, logging trail. And uh, one hopes that in time, we'll have a road that comes out not far from here, uh, just a bit above the Komuni uh, Creek mouth and go right across into the Alliance Road. Uh, you know, the, the development is a process that requires us to work at extending roads and infrastructure and schools and also every sort of thing. And this is a step, I think a good step in our general development of our country. We have indicated in our manifesto, which is our social contract that we went to the people of Guyana with in the 2020 elections, that one of the things we will do is significantly improve access, coastland to hinterland. We have indicated that we will do about 2,000 kilometers of roads. This road is one of several other roads to open up development. Now we are on one bank of the Demerara River. That road, when it leaves Bartica, would land on the west bank of the Demerara River. Once you have a road, you are opening up new lands, not just for forestry, and mining, but so many other things could happen. And besides that, you don't have to travel to Perica, offload your stuff in the steamer, or to wait for a canter load to get on a steamer at a particular time. A 24 hour possibly service with a barge crossing lands you on the other bank and you drive. We suspect that with a road some fair weather road at the beginning, you can get a trip into Bartico with both crossings, maybe three to four hours. Uh, and from what we see, it could even be shorter depending on the alignment that we, that we take. On Tuesday, the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry elected longtime executive Timothy Tucker as its new president. He sat with the newsroom's Shakima Day outlining his plans. He says his interest is on seeing small businesses succeed. So I must say, uh, Mr. Timothy Tucker, uh, congratulations on your appointment as the new president of the uh, Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And as we jump into this interview, I, was, I just want to start with what are your plans for the chamber? I know uh, you're now the president, but you've been around for quite some time. So what plans do you have? What do you want to do different from what has been done before? Well, um, thank you first for having me. Um, and and thanks again for your congratulations. Um, GCC, I have been part of the executive team for um, about four years now. The past two presidents, I've served them as vice, as a vice president, junior vice president for um, past president Indar, and senior vice president for past president Degu. Now, they have, I have always been part of their their planning. They have always included me. So, um, in terms of what I would actually bring to the chamber now that I am president. It's a continuation of a lot of the things that they have fought for, but differently would definitely be the um, working with small businesses. Um, they both are excellent leaders. They both led um, the charge, and I should say because, and they both came from very large companies. Me as a small business owner, mm -hmm. right? I find the need for a lot more to be done in terms of small businesses. Um, we would have, and that's not taken away from what the Chamber has already done and what we are doing over the last five years. Mm -hmm. The Chamber is, was have been ag aggressively pushing forward, um, pushing forward things for small business. I mean, the local content fight alone is pretty much 
for small businesses, um, but we would have done um, prob um, programs with the Caribbean Development Bank, um, which we did with beekeepers. We did one with, um, we're doing one with agro processors, and we are also at the moment doing a curriculum, creating the curriculum for a hospitality institute. So the GCCI has and will continue to be at the forefront of developing small businesses. Um, before that, I would have led um, through my committee. I, I was the chair for the T&I committee for the last three years. Mm -hmm. And my committee would have been the committee that set up the business development forum, which we ran for two years. But because of COVID last year, we did not, we were unable to hold that event. That event by itself was moving um, small businesses, trying to get them um, set up and move to the next category, maybe up to medium size, medium sized businesses, um, up to large businesses and large business to go IPO, you know, initial public offering mm -hmm. and get them into public companies. Uh, we would have set up seminars, we would have had over 50, 60 speakers for the two events that we had, um, you know, even entrepreneurs. Um, young people that had great ideas. We actually had a vision fund grant, which we had um, Dawson McKenzie, Dawson McKenzie had won that, vision, um, that grant for 300,000. That was all led by my committee and I, we will definitely continue along that approach going forward for the next year. I'm only guaranteed a year so far. So I don't want to preempt anything beyond that, but the chamber definitely um, will be pushing forward strong with local content, capacity building within the private sector, because we believe that is the way that the, that the only way that we can really participate. And once we are able to get that going, then it's, then it's all it's, it's straight to where we want to be as a country. And with oil and gas here, the mandate is the same for the GCCI, for small businesses. Yes, we represent all businesses. Once you become a member of the GCCI, big or small, I mean, we have four categories of membership, but um, we definitely always, with an even hand, represent all our members, smallest problem to the largest problems. When the newsroom returns, the story of how one young woman turned her passion for making lemonade into a business. This is the newsroom. Young entrepreneur Shane Gomes is not allowing the COVID-19 pandemic to stop her from following her dreams. Four months ago, she launched her lemonade business, Main Squeeze, which offers refreshing, healthy and unique flavors of lemonade. Gomes, during an interview with the newsroom on Thursday, spoke about her decision to capitalize on this idea and her plans of expanding. I am Shanae Gomes, 28 years old, entrepreneur and the owner of Main Squeeze. Main Squeeze was launched last November, the 21st to be exact. Support has been good. Uh, getting the name out there is probably the most challenging part um, with social media. It has actually been very helpful, but uh, otherwise I can say that the support has been tremendous. So last year after being in lockdown for seven, close to eight months, um, your routine being monotonous, not really doing anything, you have to stay home. Being the um, lover of sweet and tarty drinks that I am, I decided to why not try, try to see if the public will receive this well. And surprisingly, they did. So on, uh, after, you know, testing it out for a while, for about two months, you know, have my friends trying it, have family trying it, I decided to launch the uh, business, Main Squeeze. I wanted something that um, doesn't only say lemon. It says uh, citrus, you know, because eventually I want to branch off into other things. I want to uh, delve into other uh, oranges, uh, limes and stuff like that. And at the same time, get into baked goods because that's actually what I like doing. I like baking and making stuff. At the start of the business, I decided to join a box hand with my friends 
at the start of 2020, we actually decided to, uh, you know, let's help each other, you know, to offset expenses, expenses, bills and stuff like that. My hand, I decided to start a business. So that's how I decided, that's how I spent my uh, money. We're actually trying to get into supermarkets and restaurants. We're currently working on that. So we're actually uh, thinking of getting our own juice van, a mobile, uh, mobile location where we can actually be at different events and probably uh, permanent spots. We actually have three types. We have the basic lemonades, we have the spiked lemonades, which is alcohol added, and we have uh, the slushies, that's with uh, ice. You have it blended with ice, a slushy. Before launching, I was thinking about, you know, if it'll be um, accepted well by the public and stuff like that, but I have friends that have been telling me, you know, try to get into restaurants, try to get into um, the supermarkets and stuff like that so you can have your stuff on the shelf. But the tricky thing with having it in the supermarkets is that you need to have additives because it'll need a longer shelf life. And um, advertising being all natural and then having additives in the supermarket is kind of, you know, string away from the point that you're trying to portray. The thing is with getting into business, nothing is easy. It's hard at the beginning, but with persistence and with um, commitment, because you can start a business and then you fade away. You have to be consistent, you have to be dedicated, and you have to love what you do. Because, I mean, if you don't, at the end of the day, you'll just be, you know. When the news returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sports. Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a look at what's happening in sport. We're starting off with some basketball news. The head coach of Ghana's senior men's basketball team, Junior Hercules, is confident that the nation can progress from the first round of the FIBA Basketball World Cup 2023 Americas pre-qualifiers in San Salvador, El Salvador. Akim Green caught up with the coach during a training session on Wednesday evening. FIBA Basketball World Cup 2023 Americas pre-qualifiers will get underway on April 15th in the city of San Salvador. The top three teams will advance to the second round in July 2021. The participating national teams will include Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guyana, Jamaica and Nicaragua. News from Sport visited training session on Wednesday evening at the Cliff Anderson Sports Hall and the Guyanese players are undergoing rigorous routines under the guidance of Hercules, who contended they have what it takes to progress. Realistically, um, I, I expect nothing short of us qualifying for the next round um, based on the, the resource in terms of the skill sets that we have. Um, clearly, we are coming up against some formidable opponents. Um, I, I don't have any, any concerns specific to our ability to score. Um, just purely on our assessment or the level of practice, I hope that in terms of our chemistry, equally with our conditioning, I'm hopeful that um, we can connect at that opportune time so that as a team, we can trust each other. I, I think our biggest challenge at this level is, is our ability to trust each other. Um, once we're able to, 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 uh, to achieve that hurdle, um, I have no doubt that Guyana um, is going to compete and be able to, um, to afford us that second round in the, in the qualifiers. 2018 CBC MVP Stanton Rose will captain the team with support from co-captain 2019 BCL Intercontinental Champion Delroy James. The 33-year-old James has had considerable success on the European circuit, mostly with AEK Athens. According to Hercules, the experience these players bring are helpful to the younger players. He brings to them with a high level of IQ and uh, I've noticed that he would have was willing to share some of his knowledge to some of the players and simply that approach has helped most players to, 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 to sort of live their games. It's my hope that the, the level of um, professionalism can be transferred um, across the, 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 the team and, and hopefully we don't have any imbalance. Clearly, 
um, a player of this caliber. We have players locally for whom we believe are, 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 are capable of, of also performing at a high level when the opportunity um, presents itself. But I think that good balance with, with someone who has played at that level, couple with players who are hungry, um, presents a, a, a good opportunity for us as a country. The coach further said they have selected the best 12 players to represent the nation and they are about 60% in their chemistry and they are progressing well. But he is happy with the fitness level of some players as they mostly train every day. Meanwhile, one of the team's most prolific scorers, Teron Well said he's looking forward to returning the international action. It's been tremendous playing at a high level to be here again. I was the youngest selected in a um, Caribbean champion and uh, to be here again so it's to be great great um, feeling for me to come back. I'll be taking in a lot from the, the experience that they have to me for locally for developing my my um, skill over here to seek my game to a higher level. Ghana will bounce off its campaign at 21 hours on April 15th against Nicaragua, followed by Jamaica on April 16th at 18 hours, El Salvador on April 17th at 21 hours, and Costa Rica on April 18th at 21 hours. All games will be broadcast via e networks. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Now, the Barbies Cricket Board and the Georgetown Cricket Association have suspended their on field activities due to the rising number of COVID 19 cases in Guyana. They have followed the Big Man Cricket Committee, who postponed their matches until further notice. Akim Green reports. In the past couple of weeks, there has been an alarming rate in the number of positive cases and a rapid increase in COVID-19 related deaths in Guyana. Out of the abundance of caution, the two cricket bodies opted to put on hold their activities that were ongoing with permission from the task force. Barb's Cricket Board President Hilbert Forst in a statement said, open quote, the BCB has noted with concern the rapid rise in our country's COVID-19 cases. There has been a big jump in our cases in Burbis, and we are of course very concerned with the well-being of our players and officials. With that in mind, the BCB will be putting a temporary hole in our 2021 cricket season while we look at this worrying trend. The Ministry of Health has issued a warning of a deadlier wave of the virus, which affects even young persons. We will review the situation in two weeks and we would like to urge all clubs to put on hold all practice sessions. Our health should be our main concern. End quote. The BCB would also advise against the organizing of inter-club matches. Likewise, Chairman of Competition for the GCA, Sean Messiah, stated, with effect from Saturday, April 10th, all GCA cricket competitions matches are suspended until further notice due to the spike in COVID-19 virus. End quote. Guyana on Wednesday recorded 81 new COVID-19 cases from 600 tests, taking the country's overall number of confirmed cases to 10,718. Leading the new cases is Region 4 with 40 cases, followed by Region 6 which recorded 20 new infections, Region 7 and 3 recorded 13 and 7 new cases each, while Region 5 recorded 1 new case. No new cases were recorded in other regions. As of Wednesday, 9,473 persons have recovered while Guyana's total number of deaths stands at 251. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Now, West Indies Test Opening Partnership is a major concern for the lead selector Roger Harper. After another test series, this time against Sri Lanka, West Indies have not been able to produce the runs up front, something that has been engaging the attention of Harper and his panel. Since the Bangladesh series earlier this year, West Indies opening pair John Campbell and Craig Braffitt have averaged just 22 in eight innings. They have managed just one half-century stand for the year, 66 against Bangladesh, and their highest in the just-concluded series against Sri Lanka was 14. Those numbers are a worry for the CWI chief selector, Roger Harper. The opening partnership is a concern, mm -hmm. and I think it has been a concern for a while. It really was pleasing to see the captain getting some big scores, but still, you know, we need the partnership on the whole to be very solid and do his job. So yes, of course, that's a concern. Mm. Well, how do, how do we were 
delighted to see mm -hmm. Campbell applying mm -hmm. himself, being a lot more patient, but we need some more positive returns. In the last two series, Campbell's returns have been ordinary, scoring just 148 runs in eight innings with the highest of 42. Braffitt, on the other hand, has taken up the test captaincy and has racked up 386 runs in eight innings, including 102 fifths. The opening partnership, Harper stressed, is an area that is engaging the attention of the selection panel. As with every position, mm -hmm. we will look at what we think our best options is, consider them, and we make our decision. But at the moment, you will realize that from a red ball perspective, we do not have a lot of openers who are really knocking down the door in mm -hmm. terms of performance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, uh, so it's something that we are really uh, keeping a keen eye on. With the Professional Cricket League 40 Championship in doubt this year, it would be interesting to see the next move by the selectors as the West Indies are tipped to face South Africa in the Caribbean soon. And IPL 2021 bowls off on Friday with the league's most successful franchise, Mumbai Indians, facing Virat Kohli's Royal Challengers Bangalore, who are yet to win a title. Mumbai Indians, the five-time champions, have won three of the last four tournaments and will no doubt start as favourites against Bangalore. Mumbai, who have managed to keep a core of players for the last four seasons, will bank on skipper Rohit Sharma, all-rounders Kiran Pollard and Hardik Pandya, young batsmen Ishan Kishan and Surya Kumar Yadav, and the bowling pair Jasprit Bumrah and Trent Bolt. Kohli and Abri Villiers will again lead RCB's batting, with opener Devdutt Padikal and Glenn Maxwell adding firepower, while their bowling will hinge around the Indian quartet, use Vindra Chahal, Washington Sundar, Mohamed Siraj and Navdeep Saini. The opening match of IPL 2021 will bowl off at 10 hours Guyana time and you can catch the action live on E-Network's Channel 2 and SCAR TV. And the Indian batting legend Sachin Tendulkar has been released from hospital a week after he was admitted having contracted COVID-19. Tendulkar, aged 47, said on March 27, he had tested positive and was taken to a Mumbai hospital six days later as a matter of abundant precaution. The former batsman says he has returned home and will remain isolated while continuing to rest and recuperate. Tendulkar, who retired in 2013, is widely regarded as one of the cricket's greatest batsmen. He scored a record 15,921 runs in 200 test matches and another 18,426 in 463 one-day internationals. India is, see is seeing a spike in coronavirus cases with an average of more than 90,000 daily cases in April. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching. Be safe. See you next time.